Now let's try to be a bit more precise in what is a grammar and introduce some definitions. Some. So a grammar, let's call it G, is a sequence of productions or rules. So production, as I showed you before, we had five productions. First being B produces B and A and B. Second one B produces B or B. Third one B produces L. Fourth L produces T and fifth L produces F. As I mentioned before, the start variable is, has to be given, but if it's not given, it's going to be the first variable, and the var variable is always going to be on the left-hand side of the arrow, you can, only have, you can only have variables. So on the left-hand side of the first rule, that's going to be your start variable. In this case, production one, production one, it's going to be B. On the right-hand side, you may have you have a sequence of either variables or tokens or terminals. So now let's look at um, each production. So a production is also known as a substitution rule. And as I mentioned before, you have something before the rule that it has to be a variable. And then on the right hand side of the, the arrow, you can write um, zero or more tokens. If you don't write anything, it just means nil. But generally we write nil explicitly. Um, what else? We usually distinguish in the slides terminals uh, with typesetting fonts and variables with capital letters. So next Let's try to be a bit more precise in this notion of generating strings, which is the equivalent of, accept, of a, in a language, accepting a string. So we say that uh, U yields V, where U and V are strings that may contain terminals or variables. So if you have something like, so it's, it's representing this kind of thing. So I'm saying that B yields B and B. Okay, and then I'm saying that B and B yields this, right? And then I say that this term yields this string. And this string, right, yields that string. Okay, so it's always pairs. Right? You have this, uh, and then you have this, and so on. Okay? Hope that's clear. So implicitly, there's a grammar here, right? We know that there's a grammar. So I might want to be explicit and, and annotate this error and say, it yields with the given grammar. And when we introduce the formalism, we're going to be a bit more precise. So now let's go back and just give an example of a derivation. Oh, a derivation is something like this. This is a whole derivation. So when you start from... A, from a starting variable and you reach a final string that only has terminals, so no variables here, then you have a what is known as a derivation. So let's derive a string that belongs to this grammar and we can perhaps use the first rule and generate uh, from the starting variable b, we can generate b and b. Okay, and then we chose to replace this variable using rule 2. So I'm going to replace this b by an l. Okay, and then what I'm going to do, there's multiple ways. You could have also replaced this b, and you could have chosen to replace by or. But I just wanted to sh show you an example of a derivation. There might be multiple. So then I replace this l by t, so I use the rule 3 the substitution rule 3, or production 3. And then what I did was I replaced this b by l. So I'm using this rule on the fourth step. And then on the fifth step, I replaced l by f. So I'm replacing t by f. So from b, I can reach the string t and f. Right. So that means that t and f is accepted by the grammar g that is here. Okay. So now let me give you another example. Let me give you a grammar 
so now the interesting part let me give you a grammar um, that is able to generate well-balanced braces okay so well-balanced braces is an interesting problem because it's one that you cannot um, this is a non-regular language which means you cannot write a parser that is able to recognize well only well-balanced braces Right, so the idea is let me give you an example so what, what are well ba balanced braces so this is well balanced but this is not and this is not right because you open but you don't close in the single st I'm talking about a single list a single line so this is um, well balanced but this is not this is ill balanced because there's an open a brace that is not closed right so another example would be this which is also unbalanced because this is open but not closed or this is open but not closed so this is well balanced because all of them are uh, balanced but this is not and so on right so this grammar only accepts strings that have well balanced um, braces so how do we generate this string from the grammar that is here oh please note um, generating the empty string there so you start from c right what do we do next we replace c by we want to represent the outer edges so we could just do uh, this is if you want to do one after the other and this is you want to put braces around it so let's see c okay and then i do I use uh, this rule again, so I use rule one. I use rule one again. And I write this, and then I use one, two, three. I write rule three, and I write, which is exactly the string that I wanted to accept, right? So this is accepted by my grammar, and this is a well balanced. Um, string. So if you think about it, there's no way you could write an, an open bracket that is not closed. Open brace that is not closed. So this is an example of derivation and I underline which, which variables I'm replacing. So as you might see, there's a bit of repetition here. We see C, C, and C. And we might want to coalesce this grammar so that it's a bit more abbreviated visually and we can do that with this shorthand notation where you use the pipe bar to, to mean or so we're saying that c produces this or this or that which corresponds exactly to what these three rules are saying each rule you can choose at any time right so you can read it as an or Another example that I can give you is a context-free grammar that represents a string. This is a regular expression, right? So how would I go about and represent this regular expression as a context-free grammar? Okay, so that should be pretty easy, right? So let's see how we could do that. We could perhaps start with my grammar G. Okay, so my start variable. What does it do? Okay, it generates one and then something here, let's call it A, and then ends with A. Okay, and then how do we generate the thing in the middle? The thing in the middle, we could do A that is either what, zero followed by A or epsilon. I'm gonna write with a little E to represent epsilon. Or actually, let me use uh, close brackets. Okay, so this means epsilon, right? So this would be a way, right? I let me give you an example of a string. You can start with s. Let's say I want to write three zeros in the middle and then just one one. So if I do and I use rule one, this is rule one and this is rule two. 
If I rule, rule one, what do I get? I get one A one, okay? And then if I use rule two, actually let me break them down just so we can, three. If I rule, replace by rule two, I get zero A one. Then I do two, I do one, zero, zero, A one. Then I replace by rule two, one, zero, 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 A one. Then I replace by rule three, right by this rule. And now I replace one, zero, zero, one because A was replaced by the empty string and concatenating makes it go away. Okay, so we saw how this gets generated. We can also just generate a string where the Queenie star is replaced by the empty string and then you would, one one would also be accepted by this. So we replace one, we apply the rule one and we get one A one and then we directly apply rule three and we will get one one. No, oh, actually this grammar is wrong, it's very interesting. So what is this grammar representing? So this slide is wrong, I will edit it uh, after I finish this video. Okay, so let's see, what is this writing? This is writing something that uh, starts with one, right? And then has multiple zeros and then ends with one. And D, so let's see why this is wrong. D, oh no, it's correct, it's the same thing, sorry. It's not, it's not wrong. So let's try to apply this rule to generate the same two strings. So let's start, we have C, 1D, and we have D, this is rule 1, this is rule 2, 0D, rule 3, D, E, and this E, 4, E, Okay, so now let's generate this string. Let's try to generate this string. Okay, so we start from C. Replace C by 1, 1, D. And then I replace D by 1. Um, I replace this D by 0, D, 0, D. And then I replace this by 1, 0, 0, D. And then I replace one zero zero D. So this would be one. This would be two. This would be two. This would be two. This would be now we want to replace D by E. So we get an E here. So we apply rule three. And finally, we replace E by 1. So we apply rule 4. And we got exactly the same string as before. And we can also represent the string um, 1, 1. So how do we do that? We do S, C, and we apply rule 1. We get uh, 1, D, and we apply rule four, uh, 3, sorry. Uh, which gives me one E, and then I apply rule four, and I get one, one. Okay. So now a more interesting example, which is we saw that some languages are uh, non-regular, and now we can see that actually our uh, grammar, or our, uh, sorry, context-free grammars are able to describe non-regular languages. And this is one example. Now I want to show you how to write a grammar that is able to recognize 0 to the n, 1 to the n. So how do we do that? It's actually quite simple. You start with a grammar, let's say S, and in our first rule, um, what do I do? I generate 1, S, 0, oh, sorry, 0, S, and then, or rule two is S, and I generate uh, the empty string, which 
going to write like this. Okay. So let's write a string that has two here. So two zeros and two ones. So we start with s. We apply rule one. Now we have one s zero. We apply rule one. We have one one s zero zero. Right? We apply rule two and we have one one zero zero. So as you can see, because we are able to generate strings before and after the variable, it's very easy to represent this 0 to the n, 1 to the n, which is, as we've learned in our previous lesson, um, this language cannot be represented with a regular expression. We proved that. Um, but it can be represented with a context-free grammar, as we just showed with just these two rules alone. So another example of another regular language, let us try to represent this. Um, we have zero to the zero n and one m, where you have fewer n's than m's, fewer or the same. So how can we do that? We have zero um, and then s one as before. This would be the first rule. And the second rule we would go not for the empty string, but let's go to a, a next state A. And in A, what we do, well, we can add additional ones, right? Because we can have either um, the same or more. So we could have epsilon, right? If we have the same number, then we would replace S by A and A by empty. Um, or we could do A by one because we want to be able to represent a series of A's. It doesn't matter where we add them. We could do it A1 or 1A. Anyway, so here, there means that there is a cycle. We can generate as many ones as we want and then eventually reach the empty. Okay, so now let's generate a string that has, instead of 1, 1, 0, 0, I want to generate 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. So it has one more zero than ones. So we start with S. We apply rule one, we get zero s. Oh, sorry, did I flip the bits? No, I didn't. So I want zero, zero, one, one, one. Okay. So I generated zero s one because I applied the first rule. And now I apply the first rule again. I get zero, zero, s, one, one. And now I apply, um, the fourth rule and I get zero zero sorry the second rule the second rule and I apply a one one so now I generated all the zeros that I needed and now with this a I'm going to generate um, one one so that I have more ones than a so now I'm going to generate the rule four I'm going to replace a by one a so now I have um, 0, 0, 1, A, 1, 1, right? And finally, I replace it by line 3, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, which is the string we wanted to arrive. So you can see that this grammar represents this language. Uh, we are not proving that, but I hope I'm giving you enough evidence. So in the next video, I'm going to talk about parse three examples.